Hey guys, it's Rich the Car Guru here. Uh, I just wanted to go over the the Tesla story and how everything kind of got off the ground. This is going to be more uh, podcast style, so feel free to throw on the headphones and do some lighthouse work while you're listening to it. Uh, throughout the process, I'm going to have some pictures up. Uh, it's more of a slideshow kind of style, but you don't have to look at those. There's just going to be some pictures of me disassembling the car and some of the things that I've seen. This is going to be, a lot of this is what I've posted on the, the Tesla forum, just to kind of give you guys a pictorial view, pictorial view rather, of, of what I've seen and, and what I've done to the car. But feel free to pop the headphones in and put it in your car and just kind of listen to this one. There won't be much video here, just still slides. So how it all started was I, I had this thing for, for Teslas and I really, really wanted one. My, my buddy that works there, he stopped by my house with one uh, a couple years back, and I, I was blown away by the car. It was great power, super quiet. It looks great, high tech. I was like, man, I, I need this thing. The only downside to the car was that they're they're a hundred grand new, and about seventy grand used, and and that's far more than I was willing to spend on a car that I drive four miles to the train station. So the the only real way I could get into one at an even lower price point was getting one that needed some kind of work. So now a wrecked one wasn't in my cars and I'm not a body guy and the chassis of a Tesla is aluminum. So it would have to go to a special body shop that works with aluminum. And I didn't want to deal with that. Anything I couldn't do in my own garage with no frame machine and no lift, I didn't want to deal with. So I started to hunt for one and I'm browsing Copart, which is a wrecked car site. Uh, it's a wreck car that insurance companies use to, to sell total cars at auction. And I see this black Tesla. It's just sitting in a field in New Jersey. And, you know, they said it was in a flood. And I'm like, okay. The, the pictures that I saw, um, th those are the only things I knew about the car itself. But I already had questions. I'm like, you know, is, is the front grill in the car? Was it stolen? I mean, the car slammed. That's a sign of uh, of it having air suspension. That's good. But how's the air suspension? Are the bags blown? How long did the car sit? Is it salt water flooded, fresh water flooded? You know, is, is half the back seat really gone? I just didn't know answers to, to, to any of these questions. So the lastly, the biggest one for me was how high was the water? Uh, and again, I knew nothing about these cars at all. I just knew that they were good looking cars, pretty fast and tech overload. And and being in the IT field and a lover of cars, it's just what I wanted to get into. And I thought it'd make a great daily driver too. So the first thing I did was I know with cars uh, is that the first thing I did was I, I head online to find out more about them. So in, in January of 2016, I posted on the Tesla Motors Club asking, hey, you know, this flooded Model S, what do you guys think? You know, I want to work on this and fix it. So I got typical responses like, hey, what are you doing? This is a paperweight. Don't waste your time on this car. It's all electronics. Where are you going to get the parts from? You'll be fighting electrical gremlins for years. Even one guy went as far as to say that it's no big deal because the electronic boards in the car are coded to be waterproof. So I'm like, okay, let's do it. And... And this was Phil. Phil Phil has repaired uh, freshwater cars in the past. But, you know, so his perspective was a lot different from mine. His perspective said that, hey, you know, it was a freshwater. Just dry it off and drive the car. So he gave it his blessing. So I said, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try it out. Uh, so he, he someone said, where are you going to get parts from? And... I'm thinking to myself, that's a strange thing to say because, you know, you could just go to the dealership and buy parts like people have been doing for decades now. You know, you go to the dealer, like any other car guy, and then you just say, hey, you know what? I want this part for my car. But so after some more research, I realized that that's actually not the case. You can't just walk into a Tesla dealership and ask for parts for your car because you can't actually buy parts from Tesla for a salvage vehicle. They don't want people doing half-assed repairs to their cars. So they make it so that only Tesla-certified shops can do this. 
the the reasoning for that is that if you get into an accident with your car, it's not going to make headlines because, frankly, no one cares if you get into an accident or not. However, in a Tesla, it's national news. A car that catches fire isn't a big deal unless it's a Tesla. And the news, they just run with it. Uh, electric cars are unsafe. Think of the children. Oh, my gosh. Lithium mining, et cetera, et cetera. So there's a few articles about people buying these cars wrecked and spending over 50 grand only to have Tesla say, nope, we won't sell you parts to fix your car because your VIN's coming up salvage. And to add to that, you know, th their parts, they won't even sell you, even if your VIN's clean. You know, so even if I had a clean VIN and I walk up to the dealership and I say, hey, I need a motor or a battery or, or basically anything in relation to high voltage, they, they'll, they'll sell you, they'll say no, because some parts are actually restricted for the cars. So... After reading up on that for an hour, I reached out to my friend that actually works at Tesla. I gave him the VIN, and he, I asked for information on the car, its last service history, and he said, no, I can't do that. I'm not allowed to give a service history on vehicles. And I'm, I'm, I swear, it's like a damn fortress of information dealing with these cards. Everything is one big secret. So the interesting thing is that he was allowed to give me, he, he was allowed to give me the faults that were on the car. Uh, meaning the diagnostic info. So I was thankful for that. He, and this is what really got me going. He gave me all the faults that the car threw before it died. And I'm like, okay, well, how'd that happen? You know, did they bring the car in after it was dead? You know, he said, no. You know, the logs are automatically uploaded and the car communicates back and forth with Tesla all the time. And he, he said the logs show that the car hasn't been active for four months and it had 47 faults before dying. The high voltage internal faults in the battery pack, only part of the battery pack was communicating before it died. It, it would, he said it would probably run about 65 to 70 grand just to restore the car, stay away from it, this is a bad idea, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, he's telling me this via text, not knowing that I've already bought the damn car anyways. And it was literally on its way from New Jersey, so that really shot myself in the foot right there. Um, but anyways, yes, uh, against the advice from friends, financial advisors, family, strangers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, I bought the car anyways, and I purchased it for the grand total of $14,000. So 10.30 p.m. Uh, later that night, uh, my tow guy calls me and says, hey, I got the car. Uh, it took him six hours, okay, six hours from New Jersey which should normally take about four. He said the car was so heavy, his max speed was about 45 miles an hour the whole way. He said it was a nightmare to get off the truck, the battery was dead, the e-brake was stuck on. So in order to get it off the trailer, I had to use um, my engine crane to jack up each individual wheel and put wheel dollies underneath. And, and after all that, I still had to use my truck with the chain to pull the car off the trailer. That's how heavy this thing was. Now, it, it, not only that, but even when I got the car off the trailer, the there's a two inch lip, actually maybe an inch and a half lip that goes into my garage. So after the, the, the tow truck driver and his friend left, I had to push the car in the rest of the driveway into the rest of the garage myself. So. I put a foam piece in between my my uh, my pickup truck and the Tesla to push it into the garage. What a mess this whole thing was. You, you know, so this is a recap here, uh, in, in case I'm losing your attention. Basically, long story short, uh, I found a car sitting in a field. It was flooded. It didn't work. I asked my friend, should I do it? He said, yeah. And I started working on it, and it was a complete disaster even getting it home in the garage. It took hours just to even get into the garage. But so, so the next day, I'm sitting here with this expensive paperweight in my garage trying to figure out how to even get in the car. It, it, the car was locked. Windows were up. Uh, I look up the location of the jumper posts in the car. I found out there are two posts in the front for battery power. And this is the standard location that people use to jump the car in an emergency after running out of power. So I ended up hooking up a 12-volt battery with jumpers to the front, and I heard a loud snap, followed like a cloud of smoke. It, it, it was just, it, it was crazy. 
So I, I, like an idiot, I plugged the car in when I wasn't supposed to. All I heard was a snap, and I smelled smoke. And I, I said, you know what? In, in hindsight, it probably wasn't my best decision uh, to add additional electricity to a car that was filled with water. So I definitely got ahead of myself on that one. But, you know, what are you going to do? Uh, I ended up grabbing the passenger side glass, pulling it down as hard as I could, and 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 destroying the door window motors in the process. But hey, at least I got in the car. So I'm in the car. I threw a dehumidifier in the car overnight. Uh, I actually ended up wrapping the top of the car up in plastic uh, because you don't want to use heat. A lot of people said to use heat to dry the car out, but you don't want to use heat because heat accelerates mold. And I just let the dehumidifier do its thing. Uh, I let it run for about three days, and I emptied periodically. And I was entering, sorry, I was throwing away tons of water. You know, I pulled probably a good bucket full of water out of this car every single day. That's how much water was still in this car. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe, okay, maybe it's not that big of a deal. Maybe it's not salt water. Maybe it's just rain water from when the, the, the front trunk was open and water just kind of trickled down there. Okay? So I, I opened the, the front the trunk and I worked my way up to the air filter, which is about a foot above the trunk, to see whether or not it's wet. And sorry, I, I, I'll, let, me, let, me, let me clarify this. Now, the trunk on a normal car is in the back. Uh, the Tesla has two trunks. So when you refer to the front trunk, you call it a frunk. So I'm going to start referring it to, to, to the frunk as, as, as now uh, going forward. So the frunk, I opened up the frunk and to see whether or not it's wet. And I wanted to see how high the water line was. And after about five minutes or so, I popped it out and it was dry as a bone. So this is great news because it told me that the car wasn't fully submerged. But however, I did pour myself a small cup of water that was at the bottom of the frunk, and as luck would have it, it was it was salt water. So I was already pretty pissed about that. You know, salt water is just bad news for for electronics in the car. So onto the battery. The 12 volt battery in this car is hilariously difficult to remove. It's just heavy, awkwardly placed. The the fuse blocks on top. The battery was interesting as well because. I, I knew I had to remove the 12 volt battery and cut the first responder loop. Uh, and, and this first responder loop just essentially makes sure that there's no high voltage going through the car. It's for first responders, meaning you know firefighters and 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 and, and other servicemen and women like police and paramedics. Uh, once I cut that loop, it disables all the high voltage of the vehicle. Uh, I cut that because I removed that rather just to make sure I wouldn't die working on any high voltage stuff in the car and you know after i did that i felt much better about making an attempt uh to actually fix anything on the vehicle uh i removed the 12 volt battery tested the voltage it was like at four and a half volts so it was it was just it was just completely dead i uh i confirmed there was no high voltage in the car i decided hey you know what um let's go on to the interior and the interior smelled like the atlantic ocean it, it, it was. Uh, I know the charges underneath the rear seat um, were underneath the rear seat, but uh, the driver's seat reclined all the way and blocked access to the chargers. So I had to somehow find a way to manually move up the seat. Uh, that would involve me manually jumping the seats and hooking up the 12 volt motors to get them to move. But unfortunately, you know, judging by this picture here, uh, the seat motors were seized, you know, even hooking up 12 volt power, they did nothing whatsoever. I just got smoke. So I figured, okay, no biggie. I'll just remove the nuts that secure the seats down to the chassis. And guess what? I, I only took off the fronts because, y you know, while the car was freaking out why it was submerged, the seats automatically slid backwards and shorted out. And this really sucked because there's no way to access the nuts to pull up the seat. The motors didn't work. Uh, this was my first big hurdle. Uh, one of many, actually. And I got around this one by using a crowbar to pry up the seat 
and I took the bottom seat cushion off and wedged my skinny fingers in between the seat rails. Uh, I sprayed some WD-40. I gave the seat 10 hard kicks, and then I ended up ripping out the axle for the motor that, that adjusts the seat position. Uh, after that, I attached it to my drill. It, it took forever because I had to do each side individually for both seats, but hopefully this is the most difficult thing I had to come across in the car. Uh, and, and geez, let me tell you, the, the condition of these seat recline motors, they were just so busted up, I ended up cutting them out and just throwing them away. I mean, I mean, look at these things. They were completely trashed. Uh, again, now, one of the things I still wanted to know, first and foremost, about the car was how high the water level got. And, and after I checked the filter, I peeled back the front passenger carpet and I saw this line smack dab in the middle of the speaker line on the passenger side. So this was good. So I, I had a reference point at least to know, hey, everything below this line was toast. I had to assume that I had to repair everything below that line. Uh, and if you look at the other pics, you could see that the salt in between the wiring harnesses, I mean, it, honestly, it looks pretty intimidating and nerve wracking. And, and judging by that level, I mean, it, it didn't get high as high as the main computer looking at that level, but the, the, the that computer controls the entire car. That main screen, the MCU, that controls the entire car. So if it didn't get wet, then I'm in good shape. If it did, then I'm, I'm kind of boned here. You know, um, I'm on a budget, so a computer replacement would end me as far as I'm concerned. Because remember, I have no resources to get a new one. You know, Tesla won't sell it to me. So I, I was a sitting duck at this point. And when I was building this car, looking on eBay, the prices were running four grand. Four grand on eBay. So I'm like, shoot, I really hope this works. So, I mean, I kept working on the car, but y you know what? I, I, I was just too curious. I just... I just had to know if this whole project was going to be a waste of time and and whether or not I need to replace that screen. So, you know, I plugged it in, the 12-volt power source, to the front post again, waited five minutes, and you know what? That screen turned on. So that was the first sign of life that I got in the car and the, the next stage that I guess gave me the confidence to continue because in a project like this, you really need small successes to keep going because as you work on something like this, if you just keep getting bad news over and over and over and over again, it's, it's things like that that are going to leave you pretty discouraged. So, you know, this is just me yapping for 18, 20 minutes here. I just want to, um, give you guys part one of me working on Dolores and, you know, getting up to the point where I fired up the screen. So I'm going to take a quick break. Uh, I think this is a pretty good stopping point. Uh, I'm going to upload a, a part two pretty soon. Maybe this will be a good little talking series so you could kind of get a feel for what was going through my mind when I was building this car. But either way, stay tuned for the next episode, and uh, I'll talk to you guys shortly.